All right, it's six o'clock. I'm going to give people a minute or so to join because sometimes there's a little bit of a lag. As people get settled, it takes them a moment to join. Okay, well, welcome everyone. I hope you can see my screen. Can everyone see my screen? All good? Great. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Kevin Vonk, the planning director, to get us started. Uh, good evening. Thank you everyone for joining us. Um, the focus of tonight's meeting is to discuss potential zoning changes to the TOD1 zoning district um, and the potential creation of a stadium district signage overlay. So what we are discussing and proposing, uh, there's three uh, changes uh, that will be be three uh, pieces of an ordinance or, or three ordinances. Uh, the first is to look at making some amendments to the TOD1, the transit um, oriented nodal uh, district. Um, and in regards to uh, making some tweaks to permitted uses, yards, parking and circulation, height, fenestration, and operable windows. Um, we'll discuss uh, each of those in some detail as we go through. Uh, really, it's, it's looking at um, two things. Uh, TOD is, is one of our newer districts. Um, and I'll say one of our, our best performing and form forward focused districts and um, has spawned a lot of great development. Um, and so now that it's been on the books for about five years um, in terms of doing some administration, um, there's some things ad administering it that we believe would be appropriate to make some small changes to, um, to, to really kind of uh, facilitate the essence of the district, uh, and also looking at uh, as we rezoned uh, the Diamond District area over the last year, um, some things to help facilitate that development uh, as well, um, with really, uh, you know, not doing it in a way that will make significant change um, to other parts of the city where we have this TOD1 zoning. Uh, so on the right, you'll see a map. Um, there's over 576 acres uh, that is currently zoned TOD1. Um, and you'll see, you know, for the most part along the, the west end, it follows um, really a, a good chunk of Broad Street along the Pulse Corridor, which is exactly, um, you know, what it was intended to do. Um, some of the areas that aren't that way are um, B4 as you get to downtown. Uh, then there's some also a uh, little bit of TOD in Chaco and, and in Manchester as well. But overall, um, changes to the TOD district would impact um, all of the properties that are colored in red. Uh, the second is to create a stadium district signage overlay uh, in order to facilitate uh, development of the Diamond District as proposed um, and accepted in our development. Um, we are looking to allow for additional signage uh, in that stadium district area. And so the line in blue 
uh, shows where proposed boundary would be uh, around um, mostly city owned properties, but there's uh, one where it go just above up to uh, 9564 and it would create um, uh, overlay district in which uh, property owners would be able to do signage uh, in accordance with TOD, but then do another level of signage uh, with this overlay. And so the, the two related here would one be to create a stadium district signage overlay um, section of the code and signs. And then secondly is to actually create a district um, to show where that would be uh, applicable in, in the city. So those are the three changes. Um, one, TOD one, some amendments, and then two related to signage. We, we we cannot hear you. <laughs> oh. You got muted. Aha, excellent. Thank you. Um, Kevin and I are going to be going back and forth on these because sometimes zoning can get a little dry. Um, so we are um, going to try and liven it up as much as you can at, when it relates to zoning regulations. So I'm going to talk about the amend, how we're going to look at to amend permitted uses. Um, one of them right now, the bank use, if you have a bank, you can only have ATM access from the interior of the building. And so we're saying that there could be exterior access. Um, this would be, you know, like a pedestrian level ATM uh, uh, machine. Um, we also want to change the requirements for the sizing of ground floor commercial uses on street oriented commercial frontages. So this relates to um, if you if if a dwelling use is the ground floor use, if, if the use is dwelling units um, and your property is located on a street oriented commercial street, so that's an official designation in the zoning ordinance. Um, right now it says a minimum of one third or 1000 square feet, whichever is greater uh, needs to be devoted to um, street oriented commercial. And so we, are proposing we're looking to take away the 1,000 square feet and just say a minimum of one third of the floor area of the ground floor uh, should be uh, a, a use that's not um, a dwelling use, so a, a commercial use. Um, and then also we're looking to strike, so therefore omit, take out uh, the language that talks about the depth of that commercial use. Right now it says it needs to be at least 20 feet deep um, and so we're saying, hey, it needs to be one third, but but the um, the developers and the architects, you know, can determine what the exact shape of that of that one third is um, in order to accommodate the users that they're looking to meet in that in that space. Um, and then another use change is um, changing some entrance requirements for hotels. Um, and that's more related to um, hotels often have like they, they want to drop off people. Um, they want to have like a little drop off lane that come, gets pulled in. Um, and so kind of allowing um, for some of the, those entrances and lobby uses. Um, the next piece is some changes in the zoning requirements, uh, the, the noise requirements. Um, we have recently since since TOD was adopted, we made some changes to the noise ordinance, and so a lot of that is now is now uh, covered in that space. Um, so we think that the noise ordinance should be the place that that deals with uh, address systems and things like that, not not the zoning ordinance. Um, we are proposing to add tourist homes to the zoning ordinance as well, um, and also, sorry, I missed a bullet add um, stadiums and arenas as an express permitted use in TOD1, provided that they're not within 500 feet of a residential district. So that really takes care of the places where TOD in many places does come very close to residential districts. So that means that those really large assembly spaces like stadiums and arenas can't happen um, in those in with that in that proximity to residential uses. And then um, Finally, the, the next two kind of amendments to permitted uses is allowing um, uh, ATMs to be accessible from the exterior. It's mentioned in a different part of the permitted use, and that's related when it's an accessory use. 
um, not a principal use. And so we want to kind of make that change there too. Um, and then uh, allowing to change the list of accessory uses to allow um, flea markets, sa sales for Christmas trees, vegetable stands, farmers markets, and seasonal uses. Um, right now, actually, at um, at the Diamond, they, they do a, a farmers market, flea market on Saturdays. Um, so this will um, allow that to happen as an accessory use by right, um, provided that the use is not within 100 feet of an R district. And so these are kind of seasonal temporary uses. Kevin, over to you. Thanks. Uh, we're also looking to amend yards for ground floor dwelling units. Um, and what this is designed to do is um, to still work on maintaining uh, a good um, urban fabric, and, and that is having buildings close to the street, but allow for instances for buildings to be set back, um, but using that space within the front setback or the yard in, in a manner that really is, is meant to accommodate uh, pedestrians and or provide activity um, that enlivens a streetscape. Uh, so for those uh, structures that would have ground floor dwelling units, that is somewhere to live on the first floor, um, we would not require a front yard. Um, a front yard of zero to 15 feet may be provided for um, a variety of, of different uses. Um, so things like a, a smaller fenced yard for um, people to gather, a stoop, a porch, um, I've talked about an elevated terrace. So, you know, doing a step up or a sunken light wall to step down or some type of combination thereof. Um, however, if that front yard is less than five feet, so you're talking about a front yard from zero to five feet, and there's dwelling units on the first floor, we would recommend that the uh, finished elevation be at least three feet above median grade. And that is when you don't have that setback and when you have a dwelling unit, um, you need to work on, on that transition between the public space on the right of way and the private space in your dwelling unit. And so um, sometimes you, you may, if you're out for a walk, see a dwelling unit that's on the first floor, at probably nine times out of 10, maybe 95 times out of 100, um, the shades are drawn and there's no interaction uh, because there's no sense of, of privacy. So you're not able to see in, but also the uh, occupants not able to see out. Um, so looking to create some of that separation. So instead of separating horizontally, hep, um, separating vertically uh, to provide that transition between the public space and, and the private space. And then uh, all other uses um, would not require a front yard. Again, a building could be right to the street. Um, and then uh, depending on the size of the setback um, from zero to 30 feet may be provided um, for a variety of, of different ways that could be again, uh, aimed towards users in the building or pedestrians or, or helping with that transition between the public space on the right of way and the private space in the building. Um, so things like four courts, uh, those are the buildings, you know, kind of U shaped where, um, you know, the sides of the building will be up at the street, but there's a, a four court in the middle. So you go into a courtyard to, to get to the entrance. Um, entry plazas, which, you know, may have some, uh, you know, plantings or furniture, places to hang out, um, arcades or open walkways where maybe uh, you'll have, um, at the ground floor, it, the building is set back, but there's building structure above it. Um, things, again, active uses, recreational areas, play areas, outdoor dining, um, or for other types of principal uses that are permitted to be in that setback uh, area. Um, and then again, uh, in terms of, of limiting, just the by right, that no front yard should be greater than 30 feet, uh, except for a stadium, arena, recreational uses. Um, well, you'll have you know special cases where you do want um, maybe buildings to be set back to allow for some of that queuing uh, when it comes to ingress and egress out of those large structures. All right, uh, back to you, Maritza. Excellent, thank you. Um, so this is related to amending the parking and circulation portions of TOD1, and so that is removing some of the restrictions uh, on the location and parking and of location <laughs> on the way that we restrict the location of parking and circulation for stadiums, arenas, hotels, libraries, museums, and schools. So stadiums and arenas are being added in as new principal uses, but they will not be required um, to adhere to a, a provision in the zone in the TOD1 that says that you can't have um, 
parking and circulation between the right of way and the, the front, the entrance of the building. Um, and so we, we decided then to add in these other uses in there. So like hotels, libraries, museums, and schools where it, it may be appropriate um, for there to be a, a pull off lane um, to allow for folks to enter those places. Um, we want to amend the height. So one of the things that is unique to TOD1 is that there is an inclined plane uh, restriction when a TOD1 district is is next to an R district, so a residential district. Um, it basically says that from the rear lot line, um, there's an inclined plane that pushes the height of that building on TOD1 towards like away from the residential uh, property, um, but it doesn't specify where that line starts from. Um, it's kind of like a place, it's just not really clear. And so we're saying that it's gonna start from, um, I think, and Kevin, I might, need your help here because I need to pull it up uh, like 20 feet off of like parallel to the rear lot line. And then that's where the incline plane starts. Uh, yes. So so right now the um, height talks um, about originating from the third story of uh, a building wall at the rear of the property. But if you don't know or if that building wall moves, depending where it's at, um, that inclined plane can move. And so I think the the intent, if you look at generally like where the story height is and what the minimum setback would be from the rear lot line, um, it's basically we'd look to say, all right, go to the rear lot line, go 20 feet up, and that's where the inclined plane starts. So it would hit the building, um, most likely where the building has a, a rear setback, um, uh, a, a rear yard, um, of when it abuts uh, a residential um, property, there's a rear yard of at least 20 feet. So you're talking at a point 20 feet up at the rear lot line, the building's gotta be at least 20 feet in. So 20 to 20 a square, by the time that gets to uh, the building at 20 feet, um, it would be hitting at a one-to-one -one ratio at 40 feet. So at the back, uh, a building could be no taller. This would be, um, 20 feet in, 40 feet up, but then the incline plane continues. So it's just trying to solidify where that line actually goes in, in terms of math. So it's both for the rear yard and side yard when it's adjacent to residentially zoned properties. Thank you for that um, extra level of clarity. Um, then we are amending the minimum height. So currently um, all buildings have to be at least two stories. And we're saying that we're, make, we're proposing a change saying that the minimum height restriction, uh, that requirement is removed for recreational uses, parks, stadiums, and that should say arenas, not areas, um, so that you can have a shorter building in um, one of, if you have that as your primary, your principal use. And then finally, there's some changes to the fenestration, and one uh, is to allow for reduced fenestration requirements when there are physical infrastructure barriers. So, like, let's say your your building um, is looking out at like at a at a, like a, a retaining wall or something like that, a retaining wall of a bridge. Um, that then you wouldn't have to meet the fenestration requirements there because there there aren't any pedestrians at that location. Um, and then, or you would, it would be a reduced fenestration requirement at least. And then um, to change operable window requirements. So we're looking at right now, if you have a dwelling use, if, if it's a principal use as a dwelling use, you have to provide, all of the windows have to be operable windows, um, even as you move up into higher stories. Um, and as you get to higher stories, there are building code regulations that require uh, builders to put in uh, I put in like barriers so that the windows can't open a, a very large amount. Um, and so we're saying that we're thinking right now of proposing that the operable windows would only be required in um, two windows per dwelling unit. Or was it two windows per room? I can't remember, Kevin. What was uh, it? Looking at two two windows per dwelling unit. Yeah, that doesn't that means you would have more than two windows. Just two of them would be would be required to be operable as you get to higher 
um, floors on like a tall building. So like you're at the seventh story, at least some of your windows open. Um, there are, yeah, so that's what we're looking at changing there. So those are the TOD1 changes. Um, we'll run into the stadium and then we'll do questions after. Kevin? Thanks. Um, so as far as signage goes, um, one of the things that we did not want to change with TOD uh, is the amount of signage that would be allowed throughout all uh, throughout the district. So throughout all properties that have the TOD zoning, um, we did not feel it was in the, the, the best interest in terms of um, health, safety, welfare of the city to permit additional signage throughout uh, TOD. Uh, so instead, we are looking at an approach that provides an overlay district to allow for additional uh, signage in and around uh, the stadium and, and the Diamond District. Um, we felt in, in terms of looking at um, how a, a mixed use entertainment focused district uh, of, of this nature um, would exist, that there um, would be a reasonable basis to allow for some additional signage. Uh, so this would uh, allow for um, a variety of different signs. Um, including off-premises signs that are not roof signs. Um, we would look at a process to regulate and have an approval for um, portable signs, roof signs, and signs that, that emit sound. Um, and in terms of looking at those that are permitted uh, on a stadium structure of at least 3,000 seats, so uh, trying to narrowly tailor uh, the language to really only apply to um, the new diamond. Um, and, and really looking at uh, how things could be approved by um, through administrative process or an appeal that the city council. Uh, and that is to look at a way to um, have some additional uh, scrutiny in terms of compliance for these types of particular signs, portable signs, roof signs, um, and signs that emit uh, sound. And then in, in terms of the amount of signage, um, this would be looking at basing it on uh, frontages. And so those that were on a priority street would be allowed uh, an additional 400 square feet. Uh, and along a street oriented commercial street would be allowed an additional 600 square feet. Signs permitted along a uh, park or recreational open space uh, would be provided an additional 400 square feet and then frontage directly across from a stadium uh, up to an additional 800 square feet. And so if you look at the um, proposed development plan on, on the right, um, you'll see where the proposed infrastructure is meant to be built, um, including uh, where the central park will uh, be um, throughout this, the center uh, of the property, uh, as well as the stadium and the properties that would be adjacent to it. Uh, in terms of the, the stadium pieces, the, the thought was that um, if the stadium is going to have uh, a, a pretty porous or open interface and, and the outfield, um, you know, looking at signage, not only for the stadium, but to be placed on, on buildings that are fronting um, or adjacent to the property um, with advertising directed back in towards the stadium properties. And then uh, also it would look at the potential um, for additional signage for buildings that are above seven stories um, when there are no other signs above the third story. So that is to not have a building that has signs up the whole facade, but to separate out, um, I'll say ground level signage or signage that's directed to um, you know, pedestrians and, and vehicles at a ground level um, versus signage that's meant to be seen at a distance. Uh, given the proximity to um, I-95-64 um, and where it is uh, and really kind of creating a, a new skyline for this area um, to allow for signage above seven stories um, that can be seen from further beyond uh, this neighborhood um, would permit uh, additional signage of, of that nature up to 600 square feet. Uh, and then it would look at a, exempting signage um, for a stadium with at least 3,000 seats. Again, trying to narrowly tailor um, what that would be. Uh, I think one of the difficulties sometimes with um, you know stadiums is looking at signage that's you know meant to be directed in towards the stadium. But again, if you're having this this open and porous stadium and you can see it from the right of way, um, it's going to get counted as signage towards the public. Um, and then also looking at signage that's uh, on the ground, and that is you, um, 
you know, can't see it unless you're really looking down. So um, as you know, you've seen, um, you know, places engraved in terms of bricks, pavers or other um, horizontal surfaces, um, just making sure that it's clear that those would be exempt in uh, this particular district. And one thing just to note, um, stadium with a min with at least 3,000 seats, the, the diamond, the new diamond is going to have way more than 3,000 seats. Um, that's just a, a way that we chose to define this for this purpose. Um, so don't go home saying that, that we're only planning 3,000 seats because that is not true. Um, that's just how we've defined it um, in the zoning ordinance. And, and then this would be the uh, proposed boundary um, where that additional signage would be allowed. Uh, so it, uh, we're really looking at the area. Uh, if you start on Arthur Ashe Boulevard uh, to the east of, of Ashe, um, going up to the south of 9564, and then coming down to the west of Hermitage, um, all the way down to the bottom of the property, and I'm, I'm blanking on the street. Um, what comes across in there? It's not a street. It's just like it's just the edge of the property um, where the city owns property and then back to the, the uh, CSX lines back up to ash. Um, so this would be the proposed area in which that additional signage uh, would be allowed. Again, just focusing in on this area, it would not apply to any other part of, of TOD in the city. So our next steps are we'll give a very similar presentation as this one to Planning Commission on Monday, um, and then we will work to introduce ordinances to City Council to amend the TOD1 district, create the stadium signage overlay, and then amend the zoning map to map that overlay. Um, so after, after those get introduced, they get referred to City Planning Commission for a hearing, um, and then they go to City Council, City Planning Commission makes a recommendation to Council, um, and City Council then hears it and votes. So I'm going to stop sharing, and if folks have questions, could you please raise your hand using the hand function, and then after we do those, I'll take some phone questions or comments, questions or comments. Um, one, one more thing, let me share again, because I realized I forgot to share my last slide. Um, the, the files are all available at um, rva.gov slash planning dash development dash review slash zoning changes. I just posted this PDF um, on that website this evening, right before this meeting. All right. Are there any hands raised, Kevin? No. Okay. All right. Aha, uh, there we go. There we go, one, two. Uh, all right, Mark is first and then Mark. Sayed, so Mark. Hi, uh, good evening. Just a couple quick questions. I hope you're going to have a drawing on the inclined plane for the discussion next week because it's confusing, I think, for those of us who don't understand it or for those of us who kind of struggle. I think that would be a great graphic to have for everybody. The second thing I've got is I think it would be a great graphic to have. And again, I think above seven stories, are you saying they get 600 square feet above seven stories? On one sign, they get a 600 square foot sign? Or they get yes, a total sign? A, a, a total signage of 600 feet. So they could have a 20 by 30 sign. Yes. Okay. Not complaining. I think. Nope, the, nope. It's just, yeah, that, and, and I think that was, again, um, what was proposed, but yes, an additional, and I was just pulling up things that were tossing around. That would be, yes. Okay. The last one on the three feet, which I think is a great idea for stepping up into units. Um, the only thing I would is what happens on handicapped accessibility on some of those. I think that needs to be thought about when you do that. I mean, unless there's a rear entrance that's fully accessible, there might be some issues, but you might want to be able to think about how you handle 
accessibility from the front yard and transition up to the three feet as well, if that hasn't been thought about yet. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, it could be that um, these are single family because they're, they're the, the they could be single family or two family, like two over two properties that don't have to um, provide handicap accessibility to those kind of single family uses. Um, but it's also not like it doesn't mean that you have to go up two feet, three feet. You only have to go up three feet if your front yard is um, less than five feet. I, I, I won't, I won't. Yeah. Uh, I have some concerns about a project that was recently built that said one thing and did something different. I think it's a lesser project for that reason. And it would be nice if there actually is something of some steps that do provide that separation. I think it makes for a much nicer looking project too. I think that's it for right now. I'll take a look at the thing and I'll be, so I appreciate the, the opportunity to speak tonight. Thank you, Mark. Cyan. Hey, how are you? Um, and I had some of the same questions as Mark. I was not able to follow what you were describing with the incline plane, what started where and the maximum height. So I, I was going to ask you to explain it again, but if you're going to put together visuals, that would be even okay. more helpful sure um, can i just I, i'll give it one more one more try and then we'll, we'll come <laughs> with some visuals so what is being what is on the books right now um it talks about the the rear of a building right it has to be at least 20 feet back from the rear property line if there's a residential property it's got to be at least 20 feet back and it says the inclined plane starts at the third story of the rear wall. Well, the third story can vary in terms of like, all right, if we're talking stories, maybe it's 10 feet, 10 feet, 10 feet, and it's at 30. Or maybe that ground floor has right commercial in the back, so it's 15, 10, 10. So where that, that wall can change, but it also says the rear wall, it doesn't specify where it can be. So if it's greater than the setback, then it starts further into the, the yard. So maybe it's set back 25 feet or 30 feet. So it's it's a moving target in terms of where it starts, depending where the building is. And so this is looking at, look, just shaping the cube at the rear lot line, go 20 feet up, and then start your one-to-one -to, -one to the front yard. Mm -hmm. But we'll, okay. we'll put some graphics to that because it, it, it took us a while to get through like how it was and we, we didn't have many issues until we rezoned TOD west on broad. And now it butts up against a lot of our districts to the south, and like Sowers Gardens and those areas. So we're, we're, we're trying to rectify that with a, a more straightforward answer. Well, and, and I was going to say there are a lot of places where TOD1 bumps up against residential districts, um, backyards and side and yeah uh, and that area and carver and i know the neighborhoods are going to be really focused on that and so the more detail or the more clear you can be on that would be great because i i'm struggling to understand it based on the i, materials. I think the, the main challenge and this is just kind of a pull of so the text right now says the incline plane originates from the third story of the property at the side building wall so that's sort of like saying that it starts on the building that's going to be built and so we're like let's have this incline plane be related to the property line rather than to a building that doesn't yet exist and that where that where that story height can vary, um, so it's just a little bit less clear uh, from an administration pr perspective. But overall, we want to maintain the intent of this uh, part of the zoning ordinance, which really intends to push um, any kind of development further away, like on a property a little bit further away from an R district. Mm -hmm. um, we're just trying to clean it up so that. It's 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 more clear <laughs> to understand. Okay. okay, I guess is that language? Are you gonna is that 
on line with the presentation that you've just posted? No, it's it's not. Um, it's just, it's not, a, we don't have it yet. We're still kind of talking through. And so we'll have that more clearly depicted in the, um, in the presentation we give on, on Monday at Planning Commission. Okay. Um, and I guess Mark had a, Mark had a comment on the uh, accessibility on the front yard where you're raising the stoop a couple of feet. We've got projects around us where the, the buildings are really built for vehicular access and the front may not be a real entrance. And so really they're, they're building alleys or driveways behind and people are going in and out through the back garage. Um, and there's no front yard whatsoever. I guess anything that you can do to really make that street frontage a real frontage and porches be real front porches, because I think one of the things that's so attractive about Richmond are neighbors gathering on on porches. So um, the ha the handicap accessibility is real. Our office is in a um, 1836 building that has steps on the front and the only way we can realistically provide accessibility is by putting a ramp in the back. So just you might have somebody actually do the math on how to get a ramp up three feet and if you can do that realistically um, so that you can make those front, uh, front doors useful for people. And I, I guess you said you were going to remove restrictions for parking and circulation. And it wasn't just for stadiums and arenas, it was for hotels and libraries and museums and schools. And so that would apply in all of the TOD areas. Is that, is what you're envisioning there maybe more of a, um, I mean, we've got a we we've got a lot of areas where we've um, we've given over land to cars. Is this giving over more land than is necessary to cars? Which is really, I mean, the TOD one was not intended to provide a bunch of drive-throughs and vehicular access. So how is this just a extra loading lane, or is this? setting buildings back so that you've got big big driveways and I'm not, I'm not and I'm not sure whether I care as much in the diamond district but I do worry about what that might do in other areas that have been rezoned TOD1 Sure so I mean just just overall like the the intent is not to add um, a whole bunch of um, vehicular activity between right, like the right of way, like somebody on the sidewalk and and the principal building. And so I think it's trying to to look at are there specific cases in which it would be appropriate to allow for some type of circulation, I'll say like up to the front door. And so I think um, what we talked about is um, allowing for that circulation to happen for like a stadium or arena use, which part of like the other restrictions is like, it would be really impossible to build a stadium or arena mm -hmm. like anywhere except the Diamond District. Um, and then looking at, just referencing my numbers here, for hotels and then libraries, museums, and schools. Those are the, the only ones that would allow for potentially um, that circulation piece. And I will say the other piece that it's still subject to is, um, but that's not part of the zoning ordinance, but part of our public work is still getting a curb cut from public works. Just because like you say, you can do it mm -hmm. in a zoning ordinance does not necessarily mean that our street policy would allow you to create an additional curb cut to be able to access that building. Um, and I think it also retains the thing talking about where those buildings are located um, about 
if it's on a corner, right, then there's an opportunity to get it not on the principal street, but off the side street. Um, and so you're maintaining that um, pedestrian in, activity on on the principal street. Um, but I, I think that's something that we're we're very careful on um, is that we don't want to open it up that that vehicles can access the building for any type of building. So it was looking to be specific to stadiums, arenas, um, hotels, museums, libraries. Um, I think that was the initial thought on it. Mm -hmm. And then the the last sort of question was around reducing the fenestration requirement when there were physical infrastructure barriers. And I don't know how you're whether you mean there's a wall six inches away from it or you know, we've got the downtown expressway, which has a lot of TOD1 backing up against it. And I would hate to lose the windows um, there. We've got a lot of um, VCU health construction backing up to the highway. And it sort of looks like it's turning its back. You know, it, it's basically the it's it's the back alley facing the highway. And I would hate to have um, the the perception of Richmond be we just blank walls um, along this area. So I hope that there will still be some form requirements and it won't be the elimination of all windows there. Yeah, understood. I mean, I, when we were kind of talking about this internally, I, I actually had that same thought. I was like, hey, you might be looking down at the downtown expressway, but you shouldn't have, you should still put windows on that facade. Um, it was it was really kind of thinking about the condition of, yeah, you're like, you're, you're facing a like retaining wall. Like, are you going to have to put windows there? Like, nah, like, or, or, or if you are going to have to put windows, like maybe you still have to meet a fenestration requirement, but maybe it's less. Maybe you don't have to put as many windows because you're facing a retaining wall. Um, so like that's one piece that we're still kind of uh, talking through over the next couple of days. Well, and I guess as a citizen, I've seen a number of projects come forward built to max lot lines where they don't want to put windows in and it's a 14 story building that may not have any, um, it may just be a blank wall. Um, and so I would, I, yeah, it would be nice not to have a bunch of fortress like blank walls built in TOD districts Agreed. because particularly if they're, um, if they're abutting other types of districts that have lower heights, you know, that have, been developed to lower heights, you're going to, the perception of these districts is not, right, you know, not going to be the best. Anyway, totally thank agree. you for your time. And I'll turn it back over to yeah. Mark or whoever else. Well, I just, the, the one of the other fenestration things I think is just, um, yeah, to, to not allow for a building, right, that's just like a blank facade, uh, right, that that is not um, the intent. Uh, some of the other places where I think we had some challenges about not accessing are on, on some of the streets um, that were like built as highways and, and transition. So like Arthur Ashe where the overpass comes over, right? There's the, the the slopes to get the ramps on. And so buildings that are about adjacent to that property line or, um, you know, after the Manchester Bridge before um, SEMS, right? In terms of buildings that are built there. And so I think looking at you know our thought was okay buildings where you can't physically connect to the right of way in terms of a pedestrian right a pedestrian can't walk from here to there to access it um so so the physical limitation and maybe only what it means for the first floor but i, I don't think that means or i don't think the, the intent is that also to like extend them like the whole building i think it's just in particular cases where there's a physical limitation of me being able to like look in a window or walk to a building, it's it's allowing for some relief in those like specific cases. Like the intent is not to just say, all right, you don't have to put windows in this side of the building because it's up against a, a freeway. 
So I think that, but that's a good point. So I think we'll work on, on fine tuning that well, language. And you're going to have, I mean, there's already, a, there, the trend has been for spot rezonings to TOD1 and Chaco, and Chaco has all of these highways at all different levels moving in and a, around. Maybe don't give in to the highway and sort of demand better design for the buildings and the people. Well, it's it's also something to think about what's going to last longer, the building or the highway. And <laughs> I will say we're not also done fighting the highways in, in the city either. So good point. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. You're muted. Just to follow a little bit on what Cyan said, we're not tag teaming or anything. Um, would be, I was concerned a little bit. I think the the access is a circulation issue in TOD. It's not really a parking issue. You're not suggesting that there's parking between buildings. So I think that could be a little clear in the slide because when I saw circulation and parking and then all of a sudden then I thought, is there something going on? So I think that would be a good change in you know, in the history of downtown development, I think we've gone back and forth on what would be a good circulation for access to hotels versus what I think isn't great. So I think we just need to be cognizant of that. And as I said last week, just like Cyan said, I am very concerned about the fenestration detail on the fenestration issue, because we do have some places that are perhaps challenged, but you know, there's lots of challenging sites around the country and there's lots of really cool buildings that have been built that aren't blank walls. And I think we should err on the side of light and air as opposed to not. And that's and I think her point of the bottom and I was thinking of that, too. Look at the 1717 building at uh, 18th and Dock and it's right up against the railroad line. It's got all those windows. I think the issue and again, this might be a building code issue. But, you know, the issue in those places is really sound noise proofing and high quality windows where it doesn't sound like you're living right inside the trains as they're going by, but have a little bit of of um, separation. Because I think those things do make a difference to the character of the bottom. And it would be a shame to have people start coming in and saying, well, we're X number of feet away from whatever and we don't want windows or we want greatly reduced windows. When right. I think had too much of that here. Uh, am I am I allowed to ask the audience questions? Yeah. Um, Mark, could I I ask? Is there you feel like in Richmond, like or somewhere else, like a hotel that's done loading and unloading right? You know, I don't know where they do it, but I think the Quark has done it well. I mean, I, I, it's, I think it's the ones that want always want the pull off, and so they want to narrow the sidewalk, right? So that's their first question. Let's put a pull off and lose 10 feet of sidewalk. Um, you know, I mean, I think, you know, you're going to get the back of house function somewhere. I think it's the really the front of house thing that is the big deal, that if we're really going to try to encourage pedestrian activity, you know, we can't call for, I think, a reduction of that sidewalk cross section in order to allow for somebody to drop off. I mean, there are things we can do with awnings and canopies and other things, perhaps. Um, but I would hate to see us lose the pedestrian way for a pull off for a lot of those uses. All right, thank you. Any other questions or thoughts from the group? Here. Um, all right. Um, well, this meeting was recorded, and so we'll post a recording on the website and the presentation is on the website. Um, but another draft presentation will be shared with the Planning Commission on Monday, so it's not at all finalized yet. Um, thank you, everyone, for your time, and I hope everyone has a wonderful Tuesday evening on Pi Day. Bye. <laughs> thank you. See you. Good night. Thank Good you. Night.
Do you remember what it was? What? Do you 